number one, Luke chapter number one. Amen. Luke chapter number one. I'm going to start with verse 67. And I'm going to read for a few moments this morning. Amen. Whether you have it on your phone, or whether you're going to look on the screen, or maybe you're like me and you have a Bible. As long as you can. So if you got it, say I got it. I got it. Amen. Years ago there used to be a song, kind of a backwoodsy song, but I loved it. And then the old song said, Have you got it like the Bible says? I don't know why, it just hit my head. And it was really fast. Well, have you got it? Have you got it? You know how they're stopping. <laughs> have you got it like the Bible says? Anyway, and then I heard it again a couple of years ago, a guy named Tommy Bates sang it. Y'all, anybody, anybody here heard Tommy Bates? And, uh, this is bothering me. Catch this. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's read together. Now his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being <laughs> delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. I want to go one more, verse 78. Through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us. I want to preach to you about what the Lord began to lay up on my heart a couple weeks ago for me to share at Christmas. And it's not a fancy, catchy title. It's simply Christmas is about salvation. Amen. Christmas is about salvation. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, in the time that we have today, Lord, I pray that you move in a mighty and in a powerful way. Lord, we're praying and believing for a holy visitation. And God, I pray that you move in our midst today. We're believing and we're just praying for more of you, more of your power, for you to show up in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seen. I'm going to, to begin to talk about Christmas this morning, and the last week kind of segued into this, but um, I shared about how I felt the Lord really wanted us to focus upon me telling you and telling everyone I meet that Christmas is about salvation. You know, it's not about presents. Beyond, if I said that in children's shirts, they would, they would be upset right now, right? <laughs> It's not about wonderful Christmas trees that we got. You know, it's not about snow days. What it is about, it's about the gift of salvation. Now, God gave some prophetic words around the time of His birth to, to different individuals. And they either gave or they either received uh, a prophecy right around the birth of, of God's Son, Christ being born. And, um, and if you don't mind, I want to challenge you. I challenged you last week, but you know what? I know you're going to do it. I know you're doing it. I challenge you to invite people to church for next Sunday. You know, and 
and believe for, for miracles. And we're praying for people who experience Christ in your way and accept Him as Lord and Savior. But I also want to challenge you to, to read Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2. And read Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2. I believe there's nothing more that can get you in the spirit of Christmas than really reading about what Christmas is really about. You know, and I believe that you should skip one of the Hallmark Christmas things because you already know how it's going to end, right? <laughs> and, uh, come on, don't you really know how it's going to end? Yes. Okay. I love it, you know, but, but read Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2, and Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2. And if you really can't put the remote down in your Hallmark Christmas movie, uh, just read it during the commercials because there's plenty of commercials and you can read every bit of it in an hour. And, but I really think it's very important for us to do that. And so as you read through these chapters, there's four chapters there, if you begin to read through, begin to dissect them and, and kind of dive them out, you'll find that there's seven prophecies that's given. Now I think it's interesting that seven, and I'm not preaching on this, but that there's seven prophecies and there's seven prophetic words, and each prophecy really has one word that kind of sticks out. And so seven, if you're in the, the, the numerology of the Bible, Seven is the number of perfection or the number of completion. And so what, what, what he's saying is that he's given us the completed work when he sends Christ uh, to save us from our sins. And so I think it's a wonderful thing how God understands and he sees so much more in depth than we ever could do. But prophecy is God speaking to us. And so we know for sure that God spoke these seven prophecies because he chose for them to be included in his word in the Bible. So what was God speaking at the time of his birth? What was God really saying at the time of his birth? Can you think about what, what you were saying when you were about to have a child? Some of y'all need to repent. I was excited. Right? It was an exciting time. I wanted to make sure everybody was there. That was kind of the first thing. Because my parents lived several hours away. I was a youth pastor in, in Brunswick, Georgia. I wanted to make sure my parents were there. They had a long ride. I wanted to make sure the other set of grandparents was there because they had a long ride. I wanted to make sure everybody was there. I wanted everybody there for the event. Right? So I didn't, I didn't really have a word other than I was excited. I had no clue what was about to happen. You know? But, but so in these things, so if you think about what was God speaking at the time of his son's birth, I'm so God is so much beyond me and so smarter than I am. I was just thinking, oh, isn't she cute? Right? But God had a purpose. And God had a plan. It wasn't by happenstance that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be born. And I'm not going to talk about the manger, the stable, and the shepherd of God. <clears throat> but to me, in the, the first prophecy, the one that I'm going to share this year, is that it jumps out, is a word that I felt directly shared with the church. And that word was the word of salvation. That Christmas is about salvation. So I kind of want to just kind of give you a little bit of groundwork. We're going to build a foundation. The next week, I'm not going to finish this. So what happens, <clears throat> Zacharias who was the father of John the Baptist, he was given this prophecy. Okay? Now, Zechariah, he was married to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is barren. I mean, she's not able to have a child. And so, Zechariah is going to the temple, and he is praying. And when he's praying, he's praying for her to have a child. Excuse me. And the Lord comes one day, and the angel of the Lord comes one day, Michael, and um, comes one day and he is in, in the temple praying and here's what he says he says your prayers have been heard and Elizabeth will conceive and have a child isn't that awesome right that's powerful but, but let's step back for a moment have you ever prayed for something for so long and then when it came and God answered your prayer you struggle to believe it was real? Come on! Right? Let's step back from that, you know? If you pray for something and God answers your prayer, you also need to have the faith to believe in the answer. Right? And so, you know, the, the angel of the Lord is speaking to him, and, and, and here's what happens. He says, your prayers... Well, I think that's great. Understand something. 
that your prayers are being heard. Now, I'm not preaching that, but just take that home with you. Your prayers are not in vain. Your prayers are being heard. And he says, listen to your wife. Who's barren? is going to conceive a child. Now, Zechariah, i got to point this out. Will you put verse 18 up there on the screen for me? Uh, Zechariah was a really wise man. And I was reading this earlier this week, and I just started laughing. Any of y'all ever read the Bible and start laughing? Yes. Okay, about two or three of us. Okay. And, and I don't mean that in a district respectful way. But Zechariah, he was a really wise man because of what he says right there. He said, Zechariah said to the angel, he said, how shall I know this? He said, how am I going to know that the prayer is being answered? I pray for this prayer. How am I going to know that? This is how you know he's wise and he's an awesome husband. He says, for I'm an old man. <laughs> my case is, and my wife, but she's just advanced in years. <laughs> Husbands, even in the, the, the story of Christ coming, he is telling you out of your marriage. <laughs> None of you are married to an old woman. She might be a little advanced in years. Now, mean, we get old. We're old. This is biblical. We're old. But your wife, she doesn't ever get old. Amen? Teenagers? Listen, young adults, I'm telling you, this is good Bible teaching right here. It's helping you in your marriage. Michael, you take your notes, but this is the time. You might need this one day, right? And so what happens is that, hey, you're not old. She's just advanced in years. And the angel says that since you didn't even believe, he says you're going to be mute until your son is born. He didn't believe when God answered the prayer that he was praying. Some of you don't get the answer that you're seeking because you're praying for something you don't even believe is going to happen. Where is your faith at? Where is your faith? You're, if you're taking the time to pray and continually pray, then take the time to believe in what you're praying for. Why don't you put some legs to those prayers? That's kind of like saying, Lord, I want to go on a diet, but I'm going to eat a buffet every meal and I'm not going to exercise. Okay? Alright? And so all this is happening, and the angel says, hey, don't you believe you're going to be mute? And so you need to remember that if you want to go through the Bible, Mary was asked the same question, but she believed. You know, you had Abraham was asked the same question, but he believed. And the angel knew Zechariah's heart. And so Zechariah, he's mute, and he can't speak until John is born. You know? And in verse 12, it says, and this is chapter 1, verse 12. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, he said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife will listen to bury your son, and you shall call his name John. That's verse 13. Okay? So don't be afraid. Your wife's going to have a son. His name shall be John. Now listen, I'm so glad that I serve a God second to you. Amen. I don't know about you, but I mess up sometimes. Amen. I sin sometimes. And I need the, the grace and the forgiveness of God. Anybody here like that? Amen. You know, I'm thankful that God gives second chances. And so here's what happens. This, this is powerful now. And I'm just kind of teaching this. So, he's mute and he can't speak. And, and they went to Elizabeth and, and the baby has been born. They said, what's your son's name? Now, in the Bible, understand names, they have, they have great meanings. You know? And I think sometimes people nowadays, they don't really look at the meanings. Every one of my children, there was a reason why we named them that. Because I, I, I care. What I care. I look and I want to know what the meaning of the name was. You know? And so she said, Elizabeth, they come to her and they said, What is your child's name? What's your son's name going to be? And she said, His name will be John. She believed. And they responded, Nobody in your family, no one in your family is named John. You know? And, and so Zacharias, remember, he's one of the priests. And, and he comes in. And he can't speak. And, and so the, he hears this. And, and the Bible tells us that he begins to look for something to write on. And when he finds something, he gets something and he writes the name 
and he said his name is John. That's it. And he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, saying, his name is John, so they all marveled, right? And, and immediately his mouth was open, and his tongue was loose, and he spoke, praising God. Now let me just stop right there for a moment. God gave a second chance, right? Right? But let, let's go back, and I'm not going to pull it up on the screen, but hear me. The reason why we're finding ourselves in this situation is because, now I'm sure Zacharias is a priest, and he is serving his time in the temple, and he goes and he prays. But here's what the Bible tells us if we look, and we begin to study this out in the And it says that the people marveled at Zacharias, hear me, because he stayed in the temple so long. Right? And he come out and couldn't speak. And here's what they thought. Woo, the power of God must have moved upon him. Look, he is so changed by what God did that he can't even speak. They didn't even know that he was being dishonorable and disobedient to God by lack of faith. So when people come to the altar and people are praying, be careful what you think about them. Because they may be getting their breakthrough, or they may be getting a little spiritual book. Right? You know, and they just thought that he was so in awe of who God is. And, and, and what happened was he was taken so long because the angel of the Lord was just with anybody ever been with my God in the spirit? I, I have. Lord. You know, people say, oh, you stepped on my toes. That ain't me, it's the Holy Spirit. But there have been times I feel like I left, like I got mute by God. Lord. And so all this is happening. And as soon as he spoke his name to be John, God honored the faith, and his tongue worked again. And when he spoke, he was giving praise to God. Why? Because he had saw in the natural God had performed a miracle and he had had a child, even as a man. Right? Now this is this is just basic stuff here. And so I want to give you that because understand Christmas is God sending his son to save us from sin. That's what it is. You know, he says that he has raised up a horn of salvation. That's a prophetic word. We have salvation there. It's in verse 71 that we should be saved from our enemies. And you, you go on, verse 77, and, and it said to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. If, we, if you get one thing, know this, Christmas is about Jesus coming to save us Amen. from our sins. Amen. It's not about trees. It's not about decorations. It's not about presents. It's not about candles and all the other stuff and snow and all of our channels. It's about Jesus coming to save us. Amen. Because I don't know about you, but I once was lost and dead in my sin and my trespasses. But I need a redeemer. I needed somebody to save me. And I called upon the name of the Lord. And the word of God says that, he, that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. It doesn't matter about your past. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. It doesn't matter how much you got to make or how little you got to make. It doesn't matter if you got fancy clothes or, or not fancy clothes. It doesn't matter if you drive a fancy car or you drive a little monkey. Right? It doesn't matter if you, you eat steak and eggs like some of you or if you eat spaghetti eggs like me. God loves each and every one of us the same. And if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Amen! Amen. That's something that I need to put is salvation. It is the priority. The priority message is Jesus. He will be called Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. The name of Jesus. Now, now I'm, I'm going to kind of go a little bit deeper than what I typically do for, or for Sunday morning. And for some of you, if you struggle, uh, you might want to write. Just a little scratch. You might want to write this out. I think it will help you see this a little bit better. But understand that the name Jesus is derived in Hebrew of the word Yeshua. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A, Yeshua. 
Okay? And that word comes from the word or name Joshua from the Old Testament. Okay? Now, Joshua, I probably need to include it sitting on this. There, Joshua, we find Joshua twice in the Old Testament. One, we know Joshua who led the children of Israel in the promised land. The other was a priest. Okay? But the name Joshua, he wasn't, when I say Joshua, in our language, the J-O-S-H-U-A, that his name wasn't Joshua at birth, right? His name was Hoshea. And that's H-O-S-H-E-A. Now understand, this is Hebrew. At birth. His name was Hoshea at birth. And Moses is the one who added the J to make it the, the Joshua in front of it. Because the J in their language, that stood for the word Jehovah. Are you following me? Okay. It stood for the word Jehovah. And so, I felt like Dan Tomlin just for a minute there. <laughs> Anyway, some of you, if you know Brother Dan, Brother Dan, we love you. Amen. Yes. And so his name, uh, Hoshea, uh, at birth, and Moses had the J, which it, it's from the name Jehovah. And, and Hoshea means salvation or saved. When the J is added in the front of it, it's the name of Jehovah. So Hoshea, with the J, it means salvation or saves. Okay? Now the J, for, or Jehovah, that means God. So what the name Joshua combined with the name change from the Hoshea to the Joshua, it means that God saves. God saves. So why did God change the O to an E and make it Yahshua? Why did he change it from Joshua to Yahshua? Because it's God who is referring to God. It's because it's referring to God and directly to the name I Am. That's what it means. He's saying that I Am. And so the name means, the name Jesus means, I Am God, your salvation. Names mean something in Scripture. Why do you think the Pharisees flipped out? Why do you think they got so upset? Because they got angry because Jesus was saying, when he says, I am the way. I am the door. I am the bread. I am the truth. I am right. Because what he was saying from his name was this. He was saying, I am God, the door. I am God, the way. I am God, the bread. I am God, the truth. I am God, the shepherd. I am God, the life. And they were flipping out about this because they had prayed for Messiah to come. Are you following our going with this? And then when Messiah came, they didn't believe it. You hear that? It's revisited because the priest in the temple had prayed. And when the answer to his prayer came, he struggled with it's revisited. They had prayed for Messiah to come. And when he came, they didn't believe. And when Jesus was saying, I am, what he's saying, Jesus said, I am salvation. I am your salvation. Please don't forget in the busyness and the hustle and bustle that Jesus is our salvation. He was salvation from the beginning, and he's going to be salvation in the end. The Bible says that, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in the midst of Christmas, in the midst of all of his business, I mean, literally, there's something every night during the season. It seems like. And all the presents, and all the parties, and, and everything you got to do, you got to go shopping. I know some of you, maybe, you know, none of you probably, I hadn't bought the first Christmas present for the kids. Am, am I the only one? There's a few of y'all like that. Amen. Some of you parents are like, you don't even know that, right? But in the midst of all the presents and the business and all the things that are going on, don't forget. None of that matters if you don't understand that Christmas is about salvation. Amen. Now give it praise. Christmas is about
Thank you. Thank you. I've had a lot of great days in my life. I have. I have a lot of great days. The day that each of my children were those were great days. Those are exciting. I'm going to tell you, I considered a great day when I came to be the pastor. I mean that. It was a great day. And um, sometimes there are days that you don't even realize how great they are to be great. Right? I had a lot of great days in my life. Each of my children being born, uh, a, a great day was um, a day I graduated from high school. I, I didn't like high school. That was a great day. Uh, a great day for me was when I went to Lee and Mom and Dean drove away. I thought I was grown for all of it. About two days, right? That was a great day. I had a lot of great days. The day that I baptized my children were great days. Looking back, sometimes great days are the days that some things didn't happen. Right? And maybe we don't understand those great days. I thought about that Friday morning. I was talking to Josiah, and Asa had. Failed. And Ezra, I'm sorry, I said it's the business. Ezra failed and, and, and broke his arm right when he broke the plate on trampoline. And I, I thought, Lord, thank you that none of my kids have done that on the trampoline. Right? You know, sometimes we're thankful for, we, do we thank God enough for the things that He delivered us from sometimes? Because those are great days. You know? And, and I'm thankful for all that. I had a lot of great days. And I, I promise you take time and write, write down, Lord, thank you for that great day. But let me tell you the greatest day. It was the day that I called on the name of the Lord. It was the day that I said, Jesus, I don't want to live like this anymore. Jesus, save me. And I was in the second story of Little Old Room in Mount Airy, Georgia. It was on a Wednesday night, probably around 9 30, 10 o'clock, and I began to pray. And I said, God, save me by sin. Jesus, come into my heart and change me. And I can tell you something that one decision changed everything. I don't know where life would have took me if I hadn't done it. But I can tell you one thing, they wouldn't have brought me to Bangor, Georgia. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't have afforded me the opportunity to preach a life-changing word. Lord God, each and every one of you and who else. I am thankful that I got saved. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit that still convicts. And the greatest decision in the greatest day that I've ever had is when Jesus Christ saved me. This morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask.